Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. En route, on location, on the go. Let ICOM help you take ham radio on the road. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And by ting.com. Ting is a mobile phone service that makes sense. Save money with Ting. Pay only for what you use. Ting doesn't require a contract and offers unlimited devices on one shared plan. To save $25 on your first Ting device, visit hamnation.ting.com. That's hamnation.ting.com. This is Ham Nation, episode number 139 for March 19th, 2014. Flying high over K9EID. Hello, everybody. This is K9EID, and uh, it's time for Ham Nation. So uh, call all of your buddies and uh, get them off the air so they can watch this, because you don't want to miss this. There's a lot going on. There's uh, going to be uh, people in kilts. Um, There's going to be... uh, probably one of the youngest hams that got a license. George is smoking down there, and you're going to get to meet JD, N-Zero-I-R-S. It's a call you can't forget, of course, but he brought his hexcopter up here this weekend. And, man, do we have fun at a couple of thousand feet. So you're going to see that video. You don't want to miss that. It's going to happen here in about, oh, 10, 12 minutes. So, um uh, we're going to check into all that. But first, we got to check in and make sure everybody's here. We got all kinds of fun tonight. So, Don, what's going on down there? You had a good time this week? I had a great time this week. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a hectic week at work, but uh, started off really, really good Saturday with a trip down towards uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, to Rain, Louisiana, to a ham fest. And uh, we've got a little little uh, little peek in the Wayback Machine to uh, take you back to Saturday and show you some video of uh, of what transpired down in Cajun country, Bob. It was a good time. Okay. Okay. And, George, it was good to work you on 75. You uh, always have a great signal. You got your soldering iron ready. What's happening tonight? I do, Bob. I've got that soldering iron fired up and ready to go over here. And this past weekend, I needed a cable and I went and got all my parts during the week, and I got them together, and I found out, uh uh-oh, everything wasn't exactly what I thought. But, you know, what do we do? We're hams. We improvise. So we'll be looking at that. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, we're going to head out to the coast and see what's going on in Costa Mesa. Gordon, how are you and Susan, all the cats? Everything okay? Everything is just fine, and wow, we've got some exciting ham fests coming up. March 22nd, Houston ham fest, and uh, uh, looks like uh, Rosenberg, Texas, and then March 29th, the ham expo in Belton, Texas, and then the big Visalia. That's a three-day DX convention, and that is April 4, 5, and 6. April 12th, North Central Indiana Ham Fest. And, of course, May, don't forget, that's the date in Hamvention, May 16, 17, and 18. And I was reminded by one of our uh, Ham Nation viewers, Jeff, WB4WXT, that the off-center fed Wyndham is really an off-center fed dipole. He sent along some great detailed information and he's actually correct so all those shots we had last week we'll call them off center fed dipoles and dennis af6 tango romeo says that uh, their sacramento ecom uh, last may uh, march one they had an eight van multi ocf that was put together by ai6 rw and finally john scott k8 YC said, I couldn't agree more on the Cushcraft rivets that never get riveted all the way and the Cushcraft screws that unscrew. You need to really dog them down and where there's rivets, uh, pop them in tight or actually put uh, sheet metal screws in place. And he says, then you won't have all the trap problems uh, that traps sometimes will give us. Well, let's take a look at this past week. And we had a fun convention. And we're going to head on out to Palm Springs. And on our way to Palm Springs, we were uh, uh, identified uh, first on APRS. And uh, the APRS, a message that Don sent us, said, watch out for high winds. And sure enough, 
We had plenty of high winds getting into Palm Springs a couple days early before the ham fest. And that's one of the neat things that we can do on APRS, and that is messaging. So, Don, you were right. We got caught in the windstorm. Don Arnold, W6GPS of Avmat, works closely with Kenwood, a real good guy. And, you know, they're the Skywarn folks at uh, the Palm Springs Ham Fest, and they said, we told you it'd be a little windy on the way in. And one of the organizers, that's Gary, off to the right-hand side. You can see that he's doing something. Well, let me tell you, the Palm Springs Ham Fest, a one-day deal, was really put together well. They had a special spot for RV parking, and it was by the Desert Rats that put it on. And look at this, Bob. Look where the exhibitors got to park on a nice ball field or a soccer field. Oh. But it was gorgeous. You can see the moon coming up in the background. So we all had a nice night's sleep before things opened up bright and early in the morning. Uh, there, uh, just to the uh, head of the nose of the com van, uh, was a setup of the swap meet. And look at that. We even have snow that you can see on some of the mountains uh, way in the background. And the swap meets at any ham fest are always a big draw. Well, this was not a big swap meet. Uh, we did have a good amount of great stuff there. And uh, you just can't pass up as hams looking at all the stuff. There's some nice uh, VHF amplifiers that uh, Pat brought on down. All right, let's head to the Palm Springs Ham Fest in its first time at a convention center in Palm Springs. And on our way uh, headed toward the Ham Fest, we saw a great demonstration of community emergency response team. And you know, there is a connection between ham and CERT members, especially those CERT members that may have a GMRS license or FRS equipment. They're soon going to make some great hams and we can work closely with CERT. Well, the bell uh, was ready to ring at 930, and you can always tell a great ham fest that Desert Rats put on because they had a standing room crowd only up front. And uh, Ham Radio Outlet was one of the first booths that you bumped into, and there's the HRO team, and they were loaded with bear with all sorts of great stuff to sell at the Palm Springs uh, Ham Fest. And uh, Ellie Craft uh, was one of the large exhibitors, uh, large equipment exhibitors there, and Ellie Craft had uh, not only the KX3, but a lot of their other gear, and it was all live. And we were doing instructor seminars, and we were uh, handing out instructor graduation kits. Look at all the prizes that uh, the Desert Rats and uh, Gary pulled together. Uh, Gary and Susie uh, really got some great prizes and all of the major manufacturers, uh, uh, as you can see on the board, uh, donated a great prize and that really helps uh, the Ham Fest grow and there's a very lucky winner of a Kenwood TMV71A. Thanks to Phil Parton for that great uh, donation. Well, there he is, Clint Bradford, and Clint Bradford Man. really pulls the crowd. At uh, 10.30, he was all set to uh, catch a satellite, and uh, he was standing room only around Clint. He made easy contact with the satellite. They call Clint the local spaceman, and guess what? He's been invited to go to Europe to take part with the European Space Agency or a day with one of the astronauts. Now, I hope that, as we will, you'll uh, maybe consider sending Clint over to Europe. It's pretty expensive, about three grand, and he needs to know by the 23rd, are we gonna help him get to the ESA, European Space Agency get together uh, in um, the uh, European area. So Clint, uh, we're for you, and those that want more information, contact him, Clint, at Clint bradford.com and uh, let's see if we can get uh, clint to the european space agency and uh, he'll bring back a lot of great information but it's always fun to watch him working the satellites and as you can see the weather was wonderful we all got very baked in the sun and look at this the amateur television network atn uh, mike collis and his team had a great display and a great talk and um, when you look at what it takes to get on atv it's not much to receive it, a small down converter, a small uplink uh, transmitter. And if you have an old analog TV that your neighbor's ready to deep six, grab that television because that's what we use is analog TV off of those down converters. Yeah, old TVs work well. And um, 
It was a great talk about amateur television and all that hams can offer a served agency through ham television. All right, there's our instructor patch, and there was our instructors. We even had uh, league personnel taking part in uh, some of the demonstrations of voltage and current. And, you know, we always encourage at every ham fest that we have a soldering uh, point for students to put together a simple kit. And uh, there is um, uh, at a ham fest, students putting stuff together. There's our instructor seminar. And uh, they're uh, putting together all sorts of stuff. Uh-oh, there's that blazing, uh, thank you. There's that blazing pickle that uh, Marty was sending off. We put 110 volts in it. And it's a great way to uh, demonstrate uh, high voltage, and we've had all sorts of guests uh, blaze away a pickle, and that's always a good way to show instructors about volt amps and uh, current. And uh, there's one of the instructors uh, getting uh, his lucky uh, packet. And there's Gary, one of the organizers, Gary and Susie, and uh, he's very excited because the ham fest is just about over with seven to 800 there. And uh, in the past, he's always suggested a grand view of the Palm Springs area. So up we go on the tramway. Uh, some of the hams did not want to look out at 7,000 feet up. And behind her is the tramway operator, and he's not even looking. That's a little worrisome. But when you get to the top, you'll see the Palm Springs area. And again, congratulations, Palm Springs, for a wonderful, wonderful day last Saturday. Uh, on your uh, great ham fest by the Desert Rats. So we encourage all of you Ham Nation viewers to let us know uh, if you've got a uh, local ham fest coming up and uh, they tune in to Ham Nation, let me know and I'll be happy to mention it here because we want to see all of you at an upcoming ham fest. That helps the ham radio service grow. And bring a non-licensed friend with you and it'll be contagious. Bob, back to you. That was just wonderful. And I noticed right at the end you had W6AQ. Here's his new book he's working on. And, oh, yeah. oh man, is it great. Uh, we'll have more about this later. I'd like to get, uh, get him on the show. It's incredible. It's just stories of his life in amateur radio. We're talking about a movie producer. This guy is, he's been all over the world. And he took our wonderful ham radio hobby with him and uh boys he got stories so we have to have dave bell on here one of these days so if you're looking for his for his book the world's best hobby he's a great guy well i had a great weekend the weather was fabulous here and uh I, i've been talking for a long time to uh, n zero irs jd he's a great guy he's quite the guy in uh, vhf uhf and beyond and when i mean beyond he's going for the sky now he got into helicopters but not just a helicopter and uh, jd brought his hexcopter down and he had about 10 of them i don't know how many he has but i want to get him on the show one of these nights because he's a fascinating guy but check out uh the old uh uh, antenna meadow down here from, uh, I don't know, it was up a 1, thousand, twelve hundred feet, whatever. I don't know where he was. It's a couple hundred, but man, this was really something. Enjoy this and uh, let's see what it looks like from up in the sky. So here it goes. JD, take it away. My name's JD and Zero IRS, my call sign. And uh, what I've got here in front of me is a DJI Flame Wheel 550 which is a hexcopter. It's a, a six-engine uh, multi-rotor. And on the front of the uh, uh, unit here, we've got a GoPro Hero 3, which has a tilt and pitch control. And then we've got a stationary camera that we fly what we call a first-person view FPV with. Uh, the, uh, the unit has the, uh, a switch down here on the bottom to be able to switch between the two different cameras while you're in flight. Back here in the back, we've got a telemetry sensor that sends a, a rate of climb, distance, uh, speed, both vertical and horizontal. And then this is your uh, GPS compass. And then we've got additional battery packs on the back for uh, powering the LED lights and the 5.8 uh, 5 .8, 5 .8, uh, gigahertz uh, ATV downlink, uh, which sends the video down to this system over here. 
and with this system we've got the ability to not only look at a monitor but we've also got a set of goggles that we can wear and we can record uh, off this little recording unit what we see in the FPV camera so all your telemetry information would be recorded onto this and the GoPro would record your high definition video of the entire uh, flight in flight the gimbal keeps the uh, lens totally level wow. whether you're pitching up or down and then we can pitch it down with the control on the radio if we want a straight down shot <laughs> Here are the helical antennas to control the copter, 5.8, 2.4 gigs. It's a flat planar antenna for a little more distance. This is all really fascinating, JD, but hey, let's go flying. And he comes in for a landing just like he took off. And I'm just, I was so happy that he came. It was a big trip for him and I appreciate that. And we had a, a really great day. Uh, you can find him on the after nets a lot. He hangs around the uh, 3847 with Cheryl and all of them. Yeah, he's, uh, he's quite a guy. And uh, wow. got the thing down and guess what? Didn't have a broken part, it all worked fine <laughs> what, what a great time wow. is that cool <laughs> uh, we appreciate that jd and we'll uh, we'll have more we'll have to do some more of that as we uh get into the summer and it's going to be summer it's going to be 80 here tomorrow so they're telling Look, me <laughs> thanks very much jd <laughs> n0irs the uh the king of the vhf and uhf around here you know if you're on the 1296 or 450 or 220 or two meter sideband, you know about him. And once in a while, he gets on six meters. Well, that's what I have from here. I just wanted to share that with you. It was a lot of fun. George, you have a helicopter, don't you? Don't you have one of those? After looking at that one, no, I, I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually, I've got a little uh, parrot. Um, I can't even remember the number of it now, but it's a little parrot drone and it's a much smaller scale than that. Won't do nearly the stuff, and I don't can't get nearly as far away as he can. So he must have some high-powered RF gear on there. <laughs> I guess. Oh golly. Well, let's see what's going on in your world, man. Let's. Uh, we've got going to have an ad here first, and uh, after that, we want to get some smoke and solder going. What do you think? That sounds good. Let's uh, see what's going on with ICOM this month. HF, VHF, or UHF, ICOM has you covered wherever you go.
Check out the IC7410 and IC7200, two HF radios that employ ICOM's signature DSP technology. The IC7410 is an all-mode HF transceiver. It's got dual conversion superheterodyne system, a built-in auto tuner, and built-in 15 kilohertz first IF filter, and optional 3 kilohertz and 6 kilohertz filters. The IC7200 offers solid performance and digital flexibility. It also includes selectable filter width and shape, excellent receiver performance, and it's compact and rugged, even with a water-resistant front panel. And when it comes to mobiles, have you considered the V8000 for your next adventure on two meters? It's got 75 watts of power output in a rugged die-cast aluminum chassis, fast memory channel scanning with dynamic memory scan, complete radio control in the palm of your hand with the versatile mic, backlight customization, and weather scan alert and amateur radio first. And let's not forget ICOM's line of D-Star handheld radios too. The IC92AD is one rugged VHF UHF dual bander. Its submersible construction can withstand harsh outdoor elements, dual watch capability, a built-in voice recorder in DV mode, and optional GPS mic. It's great for MCOM and search and rescue. The IC80AD is another dual bander with extended receive coverage. It's the handheld companion to the ID880H mobile rig that I use, and it's an affordable option for hams interested in trying D-Star. It's durable and splash proof, and it has NOAA weather radio pre-programmed. The UHF D-Star ID31A has so many features for on-to-go operation. It's got built-in GPS, it's compact and lightweight with waterproof construction. It's got a micro SD card slot and repeater list up for quick access to nearby D-Star repeaters. So make sure you visit icomamerica slash HF dash VHF dash UHF for more information on ICOM's line of on-the-go radios. And you can tune in and win each week after Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash Ham Nation and register to win some great swag prizes from the icomswagstore.com or you'll also be entered into the monthly radio giveaway. And for March, they're giving away an ic 88 That's the dual band VHF UHF handy talkie with five watts of power, D-Star digital voice, wideband receive, and more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after the show tonight and after each episode of Ham Nation and register to win. And as I mentioned earlier, Bob and I were talking, I had uh, a cable that I needed to make this weekend, and I had bought the parts last week. But when I got them all together, uh, they weren't exactly what I expected. This week, I found myself needing a 75-ohm coax with BNC connectors on it, but I wanted to use RG59. This is for a video project. You can't hardly find RG59 anymore. You can find plenty of RG6 because it's actually a little better cable, but you know RG6 has a foil shield inside of there, and I needed something flexible because I was going to be moving this around a lot, so I went with RG59U and that's got a braided shield in it so it it's going to allow a little more flexibility you know that foil shield will break if you do a lot of flexing with it well it was very difficult to find i only found one place in town that had it the guy went in the back and found some and cut me off a piece here and for connectors the only thing that he had was these screw on type of bnc connectors now these will work uh, they're not my preferred type but that's all I could get, so that's what I'm going to use. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is slide a piece of heat shrink tubing on there because I've got more than one cable like this, and I need a way to identify it, and I'll just shrink it on the connector once I've got it installed. If we look down inside this connector, we'll see there's threads here that's going to thread over the shield and the outer jacket. Down in the inside, there's a little hole that you plug the center conductor of the cable into, and that's what makes connection. Now, it's kind of critical that you strip off the right amount of shield and outer jacket here and dielectric so that it fits down in here and that centerpiece is just the right length to go down once you've got it screwed in all the way. Now, these connectors, usually, if you buy them in a package, will have the diagram listed right on there as to how you should trim this thing back. 
Well, this connector is not an amp brand. It's another brand, and it was not in packaging. Fortunately, I'd saved this one from an amp brand connector for RG59, and we're going to hope that this is the same size. To begin with, I'm going to hold the cable right here on the diagram, and I'm going to trim back through the outer jacket, the shield, and the dielectric so that I'm just exposing the center conductor, and I'm going to make it a little bit longer than it's actually required, and then I'll cut it off afterwards. To do this, I'm going to use a box cutter or a razor blade knife here because that'll cut through all this stuff pretty well. I'm just going to have to be careful that I don't nick the center conductor when I do this or cut my finger. And you can kind of feel it as it breaks through the shield. And you just back off there and don't go th too far with it and you'll be okay. I'll use a pair of wire strippers to help pull this off. And I still didn't quite get all the way down. Uh-oh. This cable's got a stranded center conductor. That won't work with this type of connector. So I'm going to try a little modification here. I'm going to twist up the center conductor as tight as I can get it. And then I'm going to tin it to try to make it stiff and hopefully make it fit in this little hole in the connector. As I like to do often when I'm soldering, I'm going to put a little bit of flux on here before I begin. Because I don't want this to get so hot that I'm going to melt that dielectric in the center. Now, I really don't want this wire to be any fatter with solder on it when I get through. So I'm going to try to wipe it off as best I can. So it's just a thin layer of solder on the cable. And that's probably about as good as I can do with it. Now I'll clean the flux off with a little bit of denatured alcohol. So the next thing we'll do is trim it down so the right amount of shield is exposed. And for this I'm not going to use a razor blade knife. I'm just going to use this little utility cutter here that's pretty dull so that hopefully I won't nick the shield in the process. The next step is to twist this braid in the same direction that the connector is going to screw on. In other words, looking from the end clockwise. Now we're going to cut the center conductor to the right length. Remember, I left it a little bit long on purpose. And when I do this, I'm going to put just a slight angle on it to make it a little bit sharp on the end. Now we've got to make sure that it's perfectly straight with the wire. Slide it in the end of the connector here and we should fill it when this penetrates the little hole in there that does the connecting. You want to be sure that you don't have any of the braid going over the dielectric here that could touch the center conductor. I felt it go in. And to get, make sure I've got it good and tight, I'm just going to take a pair of pliers and hold it right here without pinching the cable. Give it a couple more turns. That looks good, but I wonder if we're successful or if that thing's been over and shorted out in there. Now, truth be told, I'd already discovered that that was stranded and done one end of the connector here. It turned out okay. Hopefully this one did too. Let's just do a quick test here with our ohm meter. The old trusty Simpson 260. You know, I like these analog meters because it's real easy to see if anything's going on. R times one scale. We'll just measure from center pin to center pin. That looks good. Now let's make sure it didn't short out against the shield here. 
That looks good too. Now while I'm holding those in there, I'm going to just give it a little twist here to make sure that nothing goes bad. And I'll do that from one of the center pins to the outer here as well. And it looks like it's going to work, so there you go. Not the suggested way to do it, but if it's all you got, you can make it work. And as you saw, it did work. Now, you know, one good thing about that particular cable, it was RG59U with a stranded center conductor. You can move that around a lot and twist it without worrying about breaking um, the center conductor in there. And, you know, I was going to use this for a camera cable, so I really wanted something flexible. And that RG6 with the foil shells, just not good. You know, the, the cables with the foil shell, if they're going to be stationary, that's great. If you're going to flex it around a lot, it's going to break. It's going to create noise and static. So uh, best to avoid those. And last week I asked a question, what electronic component exhibits negative reactance? And I had a winner. It's uh, Dennis Hagner, N3AWI, and he said a capacitor. Capacitive reactance is assigned a negative number value. And that's correct, Dennis. And we're going to send you this copy of Morse code Breaking the Barrier from MFJ, a great book by Dave Finley in one IRZ that'll help you get your Morse code speed up. We've given away a number of these so far, and uh, everyone's enjoying them. For next week, I've got something special here. A pair of Howl Sound PR. No, these aren't PR. These are Pro Set 3 headphones. Uh, a great set of headphones just for listening to your rig with or even better for listening to music. Yeah, it's got a great fit to it. The the band here on top, you can twist that around and get it to whatever size of head you need. I really like mine, so somebody's going to be real lucky this next week. If you want to win those, then answer this question for me. And it's a pretty simple question. What is another name for a capacitor? It, it's a term they used to use uh, really before the name capacitor was being tossed about. If you think you know the answer, send me your answer to hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could be the lucky winner of this set of Heil Pro Set 3s. And right now, I think it's time for a little bit of news, and how fortunate we are, we've got Don Wilbanks. Yeah, and before we do that, uh, look what I've got. These are the, there they are. These are great headphones. Man, these things, and I've worn headphones professionally for years and years, and these are some of the best I've, I've ever used. And another good thing about this, it comes with multiple cords, including one that has a little tiny, tiny little plug that will work with your eye devices. Got that little, little bitty skinny plastic on there. A lot of, a lot of these headphones won't work with your eye device, but these will. Hamfest time coming up. Of course, I've got the offroadham.com hat on. They're going to be at Dayton this year. But uh, before Dayton, last week was a really good ham fest down in Cajun country, and uh, I've got a little video to show you. I got up early Saturday morning, made the three-hour drive to Rain, Louisiana. That's the frog capital of the world, people. We're talking serious stuff to the 54th annual Acadiana Ham Fest. It's also the ARRL Delta Division Convention and a great little ham fest. As soon as I walked in the door, this little guy walked up to me. He's a Ham Nation viewer, and he wanted to talk to me, so we talked. Hey, we're here at the Acadiana Amateur Radio Association Ham Fest in Rain, Louisiana, which is in Cajun country near Lafayette, and we have Chad, and your call is... You're not a ham? I just passed today. You just passed today. And this is Samuel. Samuel just passed today, didn't you? How, how old are you? Eight years old. Eight years old. All right, I'm not going to ask you how old you are. But are there any other hams in your family? Or is this uh, something you guys him. decided? Except him, no. Your uncle. My uncle. Your uncle's a ham. Is that what got you interested in ham radio? Uh, well, he, he, oh, my uncle gave him a ham radio and I studied with him, so... Okay. So it was a father-son project kind of a thing. Yeah. Well, that's the best way to do it. So, and you're eight, and you just passed your technician today, right? Yes, sir. And you passed your technician as well today? Yes, so, So you guys are both now waiting on call signs. Yes, sir. It'd be cool to get sequential call signs, which may very well happen. I think that may very well happen. So, good deal. Well, so how long, how long did you study, Samuel? Um, maybe... Well, that's not bad. Since January. Okay. Yeah, since January. Since January. Did, was, it, was it hard? Did you find it hard? Well, yeah, kind of. But uh, some, well, 
some things are hard, but uh, it wasn't too bad I, though, right? Yeah. What was the what was the most challenging part? Do you think it was was it the math or was it remembering the rules and regulations or the what was the what was the most challenging thing to you that you uh, thought probably the math like yeah. log and stuff okay yeah. wait till you have to fool an extra <laughs> that was I studied extra for a year but uh, I lucked out and the, the math question that I had I didn't even have to get my calculator out because I knew what this was one of those studies, so so uh, so you guys studied together since January. And uh, do you have any, did they tell you what kind of score you got, or did they just say you passed or failed? I got 34 out of 35, and he got... 34 out of 35, and he's eight. If you've been sitting here thinking that ham radio is hard to do, ham radio is not hard to do. It's easy to get into this hobby, and it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. Ham radio is not an old man's hobby. It's not an old man's hobby. This is the future of ham radio. These guys right here, father and son taking the, the technician class together and passing. This is the future of ham radio. Samuel, congratulations. I'm so proud of you. Chad, I'm so proud of you as well. And I'm looking forward to getting you guys in my log when you guys get your call sign. You're gonna go for you're gonna go for general and extra, aren't you? Yes. I sure hope so. I am so proud of you guys. So that's a story here from Rain. Eight years old, brand new ham, dad a brand new ham. It ain't hard, people. Isn't that just the greatest story? Of course, you got to check out the crawfish boil and Cajun Fade Do Do on Friday night. But of course, the Ham Fest is all about the flea market and the people and the vendors. Here's a first time vendor to Rain. Back at the Rain Ham Fest, and we're talking with Richard KI5DX. He is the man behind Maine Trading Company in Paris, Texas. Tell me a little bit about how Maine Trading Company got started, because you're, not, you're not, not a very old company, are you? No, five years, almost five years. Um, June of this year will be in business five years. Um, we started, I lost my job there in Paris. I, I'm a salesman by trade. And, um, uh, but I've always been interested in ham radio and have been very active in ham radio. Um, the worst possible economy ever, ever there in Paris, Texas, we yeah. decided to start a business. Um, you know, with, uh, with a, a lot of prayer and a lot of help, it's, we're still five years into it. Good, now, and uh, you, you carry Pretty much all of the major brands. Yeah, I know you carry Icom. Icom. You carry Kenwood. Kenwood. Kenwood's kind of a cool story. Tell me a little bit about your association with Kenwood. Kenwood. I've always ran a lot of Kenwood gear myself at home, and uh, and talked to the the national uh, sales manager a lot by telephone. And um, one one day at Hamcom in Dallas, I approached him again about becoming a dealer, and he said, Richard, I've been thinking about you. We're going to sign you up. And the rest with Kenwood is history. We're number one in Texas now. Not bragging. And nationally with Kenwood? Number four in the nation. Number four or five, depending on the month. And that's a five-year-old company. There are, there are companies that have been around for a lot longer that, that don't have the success that you guys at Main Trading are having. And um, we got to make Ray Novak happy, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know and Ray officially that I'm I'm buying my ID51 today from Main Trading. All so, right, we'll ring the bell. Absolutely, we'll ring the bell. Uh, MTCRadio.com, Main Trading, great company, fabulous people, cigar smokers. So hey, right there, you there know, you know. it's us. So there you go, Main Trading here at the Rain Hand Fest. <laughs> Oh, I got a new toy. Thanks to Emmett, W0QH from Radio Waves for the help with photography and video. And I'll be looking for you next year at Rain. 7-3. Oh, great. There we go. I hate when I'm muted. There it is, the new toy, ID51. So got to make Ray Novak happy. All right, I'll tell you what, let's get caught up with the news while I figure out how to use this thing. Let's check out Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 1,909, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, March 19, 2014. The disappearance of a Malaysian airline Boeing 777 jetliner with 239 passengers on board is a mystery that at least 25 nations are trying to solve. But during its early hours, Ham Radio was called in to help with the human aspect of the situation. When Malaysian airline flight MH370 bound for Beijing disappeared from the air traffic radar, the emergency management center at Kuala Lumpur Airport provided accommodation for all next of kin at the Everly Hotel at Putrajaya. 
The Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitter Society President, Mohid Aris Bernawi, 9M2IR, said his group was asked to provide a communications link between the airport and the hotel. 9M2IR said the Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitters Society quickly set up a station at the hotel led by Zanirul Akhmal Zaniram 9M2PRO with a ZZ Samsuri 9W2ZZE as the team leader. The Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitters Society also provided a crossband VHF to UHF link to avoid any unnecessary interference from the public services. An HF link was later added. The Negeri Sabilan Amateur Radio Club provided the volunteers for the station at the airport's emergency management centre. During the call-out, there were 11 volunteers at the airport and 23 at the hotel, all on rotating shifts. 9M2IR oversaw the entire process for the Malaysian Amateur Radio Transmitter Society. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF in Nelson, New Zealand. The work continues on the ham video system on board the International Space Station. Here's Skeeter Nash and 5ASH. Steps 1 and 2 of the commissioning of the new ham video transmitter system on board the International Space Station have been completed and deemed a total success. Presently, ham video is transmitting a blank image with no audio in what is being called Configuration 1. The signal is on 2422 MHz with a symbol rate 1.3. Blank transmission will then move to 2395 MHz at the same symbol rate. These blank transmissions will continue until the next commissioning step, which is planned for April 12th. Reports from ground stations during blank screen transmissions are welcome and will allow further analysis of their performance and radiation characteristics from the ISS. Recordings of signals received during commissioning steps at Matera Ground Station will be made available on the British Amateur Television Club server. If you see one of those test transmissions, you can help by filing a signal report. The link for that website can be found in both the printed and full audio edition of this week's Amateur Radio Newsline report. When you need the sound of a working spark gap transmitter, who are you going to call? The ARRL. When the daily national public radio series All Things Considered needed such a sound, that's exactly where they went. The sound effect was required for an episode titled, What If World War I Had Never Happened? In order to provide such a sound effect, the ARRL media and public relations manager Sean Kutzko, KX9X, took a short trip over to the ARRL lab, where there just happens to be a working spark transmitter. There he took the provided script and sent it by hand, as the sound of the spark transmitter was recorded. You can hear the result of KX9X effort when the show airs on your local NPR outlet or soon thereafter on the NPR website. You'll find that at npr.org. Some sad news. World-renowned Morse code preservationist Nancy Cott, WZ8C, of Metamora, Michigan, died March 2nd at the age of 58. Again, Skeeter Nash in 5ASH. Nancy Cott was the former editor of World Radio magazine and was with it during its transition to World Radio Online. This was the United States' very first electronic-only publication ham radio periodical. But she is likely best remembered as the member of the United Kingdom-based Morse Code Preservationist Group known as the Fists CW Club, who was instrumental in bringing knowledge of that society to U.S. shores. She operated the Fists booth each year at the Dayton Hamvention and was a speaker at several seminar sessions over the years. According to the ARRL, WZ8C was a member of its A1 Operator Club. She was also an honorary member of the Texas DX Society and a member of the group's de-exposition to Belize in 2006. She also operated from the British Virgin Islands as VP2V stroke WZ8C in 2007. If you're going to Dayton this year, please stop by the Fist's booth and leave your regards. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news brought to you each and every week for over 35 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Yeah, it's just not going to be the same at, uh, at Dayton without her at the Fist booth. She's been a fixture there forever. And uh, interesting stuff about the Spark Gap. It's interesting that, uh, that that's what Ham Radio, or all radio for the most part, started with. Uh, Morse code and a big spark. And now, what, 100 years later? Here's where we are. A lot of technology in the palm of your hand here, just like cell phones, too. Let's go to Kansas and see what's going on with Dale and uh, our videos of the week. Dale? Okay, Don. Uh, good evening to you. Are you ready for the big dance starting uh, tomorrow there uh, and all the 64 teams, Don? Yeah, I filled out my bracket. I've never done that before. I have no clue 
what I'm doing. I'm in a pool at work, which, of course, since I have absolute, I can spell basketball correctly three out of five times, which means since this is my first time filling out a bracket, I'll probably win. <laughs> it should be fun. Well, we've got our Jayhawk Cup here this evening. And, uh, of course, we got the Shockers, uh, number one seed in the Midwest, and uh, Kansas State all playing at St. Louis uh, Friday. So uh, it's going to be exciting around here. <laughs> well, tonight, uh, IWCE fans just happen to be hams. Uh, part four of an 11-part series covering HF Mobile Operation. A very creative CQWW DX video and a brand new club website of the week. Let's kick off the videos with the Ham Nation fans gathering for the International Wireless Communications Expo next week in Las Vegas. It seems that many of these professionals are also hams. Don Hill, KE6BTX, produced this video at last year's expo, especially for Ham Nation. Hi, I'm Kevin Karamanis, call sign WD6DIH, and I'm a fan of Ham Nation. Hello, I'm Jared Madsen, Kilo Delta 7 Zulu Charlie Romeo, and I am a fan of Ham Nation. Hi, I'm Steve, NA5C. I'm absolutely a fan of Ham Nation. Hi, I'm Kirk Rasmussen, KD7YE from Utah, and I'm a fan of Ham Nation. Hi, I'm Zachary Douglas, KD6MVT. I'm with Anritsu Company, and I'm a fan of Ham Nation. I'm JD Davio, KD4OAG, and I'm a fan of Ham Nation. Hi, I'm Mike Herbert, WB6JKV with GRE America slash Alinko, and I'm a huge fan of Ham Nation. 73 all. Hi, it's Julia with Blue Eye. I'm a fan of Ham Nation. Hi, I'm Bill Leppard, K1BMW. I'm a member of the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary Communications Officer, Lake Tahoe, and I'm an extreme fan of Ham Nation. Hi Gordo, hi Bob. This is Doug Wynn, WY6NN, and I'm a fan of Ham Nation. Hi, I'm David Witkowski, Whiskey 6 Delta Tango Whiskey, here at the IWCE convention, and I'm a fan of Ham Nation. Brian Walker, AA6QG. Michael Fetto, KB2FX. Ken Pekigo, KC2AYK. Bill Tevin, KD8DSF. We're All with Bird Technologies, Technologies, and we're, we're a fan of animation. Right. Oh. oh, wow. That, that is uh, that is something else. Uh, nice job, Don. Thanks for sending that in. And uh, that's only about a third to a half of the uh, testimonies at the International Wireless uh, Communications uh, Expo last year. So if you want to see those, we'll have them linked on hamnationvideos.info for you. Well, let's look now at our club website of the week. It's www.w4ava.org, the website of the Arlington Radio Public Service Club. The site was nominated by Mike Aviat. It highlights the public service work performed by the local races organization during the year, including assistance to the Marine Corps Marathon, activities of the many emergency communications organizations in the D.C. area, and the club newsletter. Mike also sent us a PowerPoint presentation in PDF format that includes a go-kit list. Uh, the club uses the presentation for emergency communications training. We posted the PDF at hamnationvideos.info for your downloading pleasure. And when you get a chance, make sure to check out this week's featured club website, www.w4ava.org. Let's move on now to part four of our 11-part series on mobile HF operations. Tonight's topic, mobile HF wiring, part one of three. And here's Dan, N9LVS. This video is mobile HF wiring, part one. Warning, we're talking about electricity. Use proper precaution. 
it will become apparent that wiring amateur radio equipment in late model vehicles is becoming more difficult and exacting. With that thought in mind, here are the salient points to remember. Never use any existing wiring to power any amateur radio gear. The chassis of the vehicle should never be used as a ground return. The wire should be connected directly to the battery or jump point as the case may be. Wiring should be done in a way to avoid circumventing any battery monitoring system. Direct connection to an output of a voltage stabilizing system should be done only with the advice of a vehicle dealer's personnel. The wiring should be sized large enough to limit voltage drop to less than 0.5 volts while under full load. Wire must be properly fused to protect it from shorts. Avoid using circuit breakers no matter what rating. The wiring needs to be protected from abrasions, excessive heat, and automobile chemicals. The wiring should be routed in a neat and tidy manner to avoid interaction with passengers and mechanical devices. The wiring insulation temperature rating should be at least 90C, 195 degrees Fahrenheit, in the passenger compartment, and at least 105C, 220 Fahrenheit, in the engine compartment. Termination lugs should be properly crimped and or soldered. Regular inspection and or scheduled maintenance of wiring is an important undertaking. So let's go play in the Devil's Playground. Never use existing wiring to power amateur radio transceivers. This includes accessory cigarette lighter sockets. Typically wired with 16 gauge wire, they're inadequate to handle even the average current draw of an amateur HF transceiver, much less the peaks, no matter its power rating or fuse size. If you do, you run a very great risk of causing electrical fire, the most costly of vehicle repairs and the most traumatic as well. So let's discuss power connections. There are two schools of thought with respect to where the power cable ground of an amateur radio transceiver should be connected, but both agree that the chassis should not be used as a ground return. While this practice is widespread in the past, doing so in a modern vehicle should be avoided at all cost. It is important to remember that today's vehicles are rolling computers, with some models having as many as 80 CPUs controlling everything from ABS to VSS. Each one of these CPUs has a sensor connected to it, which controls every facet of operation. Using the chassis for a ground return can cause a ground loop to occur, which can corrupt the data from them. The first school of thought is to connect the negative lead directly to the battery. ICOM, Yezu, and Kenwood all recommend this method, as does every automobile manufacturer. However, this method requires that the negative lead be fused. The second school of thought is to connect the ground lead to the battery's chassis ground point. The negative lead doesn't need to be fused in this case. Both methods work equally well. However, on most newer vehicles with idle engine shutoff, both methods require scrutiny, high power or not. And if all else fails, talk to a mobile electronics certified professional or an ASE certified mechanic about your ham radio installation. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, in addition to producing these outstanding training videos. Dan maintains our official Ham Nation wiki, and he also takes care of the hamnationvideos.info website. Well, to close out the videos this evening, let's take a look at a very creative report covering the 2013 CQ Worldwide DX contest. Paolo Bianacci, IZ5NFD in Italy, thought it would be nice to Combine the audio from his station with QRZ data about the operators he worked. It's a pretty neat idea. Let's watch it together. Thank you, QRZ Italy, Zulu 5, November, Fox Delta contest. Kilowatt 2, Echo Papa. Kilowatt 2, Echo Papa, 5915. Thank you, 5905. Uh, thank you, QRZ. Norway 4, Zulu, Zulu Charlie. Charlie. Uh, Nor Norway 4, Zulu Charlie, 5915. Thank you. Alpha Baker Zero, Romeo X-ray. Alpha Baker Zero, Radio X-ray, 5915. 594. Thank you. QRZ, IZ-5 NFT contest. Whiskey 3 Echo Kilo, Tango. Uh, Whiskey 3 Echo Kilo, Texas, 5915. QSL 5905. Thank you. QRZ. Uh, Kilo 3 Golf Mike, 5915. Yes, Whiskey 3 Golf Mike, 5995. Uh, Whiskey 3 Golf Mike, uh, thank you. Thank you. QRZ, IZ-5 NFT contest. Uh, kilo 3 Italy, Papa Kilowatt, 5915. Thank you, QRZ. Uh, kilo 9 Oscar Mike Whiskey, 5915. Well, thanks, Paolo. We uh, love that approach to the coverage of 
the 2013 CQWW DX contest. Really uh, interesting approach and made it fun and it gives you a feel for the contest. Well, don't forget to vote for the February winner of the Ham's Choice Award. Uh, Dan sent me a preview of the current uh, rankings and it's a close race this time between three or four of the videos. So make sure to vote for your favorite. The winner will uh, receive the Storm Spotting and Amateur Radio Book from the ARRL. It'll be courtesy of the Ham's Choice Award sponsor. Uh, that's Mark, KB0MOF, down at the Ham Radio Center in Derby. Voting closes at midnight Tuesday. That's next week, March 25th. And we'll announce the winner on episode 140. That's next Wednesday on Ham Nation right here. If you need to review the February videos, you'll find a permanent link to all of those videos at hamnationvideos.info. Next week, N9LVS is back. Dan will have his second in the three-part series about mobile HF wiring. And we're still short on videos, so please, please send your videos as well as your shack photos to hamnationvideos at TWIT.TV will get them on Ham Nation for you. We've received a lot of photos over the last week. We might even have to uh, move it up to uh, uh, every two to three weeks if the photos keep coming in like they have been. Well, that's it for tonight. Have a great week. Enjoy the NCAA March dance. Cheryl will be right here next with questions from the chat room, but... Uh, First, we're going to check in with Don, find out about the latest at Ting. Don, take it away. I will do that. You caught me taking my old man glasses off. Look at that. See, I can't see anything because I'm an old man. I'm, I'm well, I'm relatively old man. I'm, I'm, but ham radio is not an old man's hobby. But I digress. Let's talk about Ting. Ting is not, I'll tell you what Ting is not. Ting is not a cell phone company. Ting is a reseller of the nationwide Sprint Network. Something else they don't deal in is BS. Ting is an OBS mobile service. You can have as many devices as you want on one plan, sharing your pooled minutes, messages, and megabytes. Unlimited devices, one plan, and every device on your plan just costs a flat $6 per month. Each device, 6 bucks a month. And the pricing is just amazing, and the rates just got better. Ting got better prices from Sprint. They're going to share the savings directly with the customers. <gasps> Shocker. No, that's not what Ting. It's not nothing fancy either, just better rates, lower monthly bills, and that's it. And if you've already tried the Ting's savings calculator to check out how much you could be saving with Ting, it's uh, probably worth your while to do another check to see just how much more you could be saving. And, of course, Ting has no contracts ever, and you only pay for what you use each month. That's your megabytes, your messages, and your minutes, and they're all billed separately. And your voicemail, your caller ID, tethering, hotspot, three-way calling, call forwarding, all the other cool things you like, all part of the service. No add-on charges. I mentioned uh, they're uh, contract-free. They're completely contract-free. Also, no early termination fees or any of that other BS. They'll give you credit if you're having to pay an ETF to come to Ting. They'll give you 25% credit of your ETF, up to $75 per device just for coming to Ting. You can find out more about that at ting.com slash ETF. And they charge you for what you use, and that's it. Plus, well, whatever charges they're legally required, taxes and things, uh, no hidden charges, no recovery fees, none of that other stuff. Take total control of your account, your usage, and your bills with a powerful online control panel. Ting is amazing. You can do pretty much do everything online. If you do need to talk to a human being, you can do so at 855-TING-FTW. And that's available anytime, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And a real live actual person will pick up the phone. And, of course, like I said, you can do pretty much everything online. Help.ting.com if you get stuck. They have active customer forums, simple and powerful help ticketing system, video tutorials, startup guides, and a whole lot more. Here's how it works. You purchase your mobile device from Ting. You'll get that in two to five business days. Or... If you've got a Sprint phone laying around, like say uh, maybe you, you know, you're with Sprint now, but you want to see if Ting can save you some money and you find out that they can, you've got an iPhone 5 or a 4 or a 4S, yeah, you can bring that over to Ting. That's not a problem at all. You can see the full list of eligible phones. Go to the show's special URL. Click on the BYOD. Bring your own device link at the top of the page. Ting will even help you turn your old device into cash to help you with the move to Ting. And after you activate the device... With Ting, you'll have the option to select a new phone number, or if you want to bring your existing one over, you can do that as well. 
Your uh, minutes will be broken out by uh, by minutes, text messages, and megabytes, and uh, you'll get your bill at the end of the month for what you've used, and that's it. Simple as it can be. Hamnation.ting.com. That's where you want to go to save money and better manage your mobile phone usage with Ting. Check out their savings calculator. See how much you or your company could save. And because you're a Ham Nation viewer, well, you lucky dog, you get $25 on your first Ting device when you sign up. Hamnation.ting.com. Dot com start saving today your life will be so much better you'll almost be as good looking as cheryl cheryl what's going on over there in the up in the, the cold country where you are darling hey don <laughs> it's smooth, still gonna I? be a little bit cold but i want to say hi everyone i'm cheryl asik and i'm an extreme fan of ham nation and i had to yeah. say that because i just love it yay <laughs> all right um Let's. Uh, I have a. I have a comment here. I'd like to, to to just move into. There's quite a few tonight. You guys are pretty talkative, so that's a good thing. Thank you very much for your questions. And Phil from, um, I believe it's Portugal, CS7AFP. I wanted to just say he he asked me to announce this, and he says the bureaus in Europe are taking too much time to deliver QSL cards because of the customs. They're taxing the packages of QSL cards. So might I recommend the logbook of the world or possible e-QSL cards in, in, uh, in lieu of the hard uh, cards being sent over? I guess they just take too long, and I wanted to get that out because he had that from last week. There was just a little bit too much going on there. So let me dig uh, down deep into my email bag here, and let's move on to uh, Gordo here. Good evening, Gordo. I've got some questions for you. And here's one I'm from good. Katie. Hi. <laughs> Here's one from KD9, AEZ Matt. He says, can you please explain third-party traffic to me and what is legal? Can my wife transmit with my equipment, with me present, et cetera? Over to you, Gordo. Okay, that's great. Well, the licensed operator is party one. To whom you're speaking over the airwaves, that's a licensed operator is party two. And now uh, maybe uh, your young kids come in the room that would be third-party traffic if they are not licensed. Now, um, could they come in and just pick up a conversation and call CQ using your call sign? No, that would violate your control operator responsibility. So once you establish comms, and as long as you do your own identification every 10 minutes, third-party traffic is perfectly permissible throughout the United States and to those many countries that we have a third party agreement. So go for it, get more unlicensed TAMs on the air, be a third party, but remember you need to initiate every 10 minutes ID and then terminate yourself the call. Back to you, Cheryl. Hey, great Gordo, and I do have one more, so stand by from this one from VA3XMR. Or Aurelius, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. I apologize if I didn't get it right. But he asked, um, is the technician test fairly difficult? How long does it take to do the 35 questions he believes it is? And are they multiple choice? Gordo, okay. over to you. All right. Uh, here in the United States, it's a pool of about 360 questions. The pool is going to change come July 1st. But very minor change. So even if you're studying the current book and take the test after July 1, you should get the new book, but you'll still probably pass with ease. 35 questions are selected for the technician class exam. You need 34% to pass a correction. You need 74% to pass the uh, technician class exam. And yes, the answers are multiple choice exactly as they're published in the question pool and in study A. It's back to you, Cheryl. Hey, great. Thanks for that answer. And let me dig down deep again to maybe another one here. Oh, yes, here. We have W4BKB Brian from Tennessee and Jay, KE6SLS, with similar questions, uh, with a similar type question. It's kind of a multiple question, but I'm going to try and field this one first, and then I'm going to get some other ideas too. Possibly, uh, maybe we'll, we'll do Gordo. They want to know about... Um, 10 meter antennas for the new ham what antennas could they put in they're mainly interested in attic antennas and here i'm going to go with the recommendation uh, from my floor director here he says this is fantastic the awrl small antennas and small spaces he says the illustrations 
in this book are just fantastic, and they probably will have something in there for you. Um, so try and get a hold of that. It's not really that thick. You can see it, but the illustrations are really nice. There's a lot, a lot of coverage in there because the pages are really big. This is a really big book. It can cover up the whole um, camera there. So, Gordo, do you have any other suggestions for, uh, for small antennas or attic-type antennas? Um, over to you. You bet a great attic antenna would be eight and a half feet in one direction, eight and a half feet in the other direction. Uh, wrap some wire around your hand to act as a ballon, uh, as a coaxial ballon. And one side of the coax goes to one side and the other goes to the other. You now have a half wave, horizontal or an inverted V dipole. And it will kick rear on the 10 meter band, especially wow. when the band opens for thousands of miles of contacts. It sounds terrific, Gordo. That's that's really nice for people that really can't uh, put something out there and they have limited spaces. So I hope that answers it for you. And you know, we're going to move down to uh, George. Are you on the on the on the air tonight? So I can get this question to you. Yes, I am on the air, Cheryl. That sounds great. Well, let's let's get another question from W4BKB Brian. Um, he also has uh, this for you. Um, will you damage your radio if you do not have your antenna with the proper SWR? George, over to you. Um, most newer radios have uh, SWR overload protection in them, so they'll crank back the power if you get too high. Uh, a lot of the older ones did not have that. I, I still wouldn't trust that, uh, even on the newer radios. It's best to get your SWR correct. Um, and, y you know, you might get away with it, but uh, I, I can't recommend that. And when we get a chance here, Cheryl, I've got some breaking news. Oh, really? Great. That sounds terrific. But can you take one more? Because it's kind of a, a special question. And... Uh, it's just about broadcast uh, audio gear. So here it is. How do you connect broadcast audio gear to the IC7200? George, go ahead. Um, I've done some um, segments in the past uh, on connecting external audio gear to your rig. And those examples in there will work with the 7200. But perhaps I can revisit that with a look at that radio but you know there's a couple of different ways you could do it you could run it into the mic jack on front that's not the best way or you could run it into the auxiliary connector on the rear and that's the method i prefer because you can run a little bit higher level of audio in there and also you're bypassing a lot of the circuitry in the mic preamp of the rig so you'll get cleaner audio uh, you can also get receive audio out of that uh, jack as well and connect it to a mixer or an amplifier or whatever you have. There are, you know, a few things you'll want to do in there. So maybe we better just revisit that again here in the future and, and go over some of the possibilities. Sounds great. Sounds great. And before you're breaking news, this is one question that Jay, KE6SLS, so wanted me to ask you. And he says, can you regrind soldering iron tips? I've been doing it and it seems to work okay. What are your thoughts on that, George? You can do that, and I have done that years ago. Um, you know, most of the soldering tips these days have plating on them. In the old days, you'd buy a tip, and it was just copper. But uh, most of the newer ones, they're copper, and then they've got a, a plating on it that's uh, good for soldering with. If you grind it down, you're going to scratch off that plate. But, hey, if you need to do it, you know, if, if the existing tip is not good, then you might as well go ahead and uh, give it a shot. You'll want to retin it after you do that, though. You know, get some solder flowing on it and let it kind of uh, seat in there good on it because you always want to tin your soldering tips before you begin soldering with it, particularly on a case like that. Okay, great. And I think it's time for your breaking news, George. So... Um, go with your breaking news. Well, my breaking news, you know, we've uh, heard some rumors about a new ICOM rig coming out there, the ID5100A. Well, I believe it has just been released, <laughs> and it's so breaking, oh. I just had to print it out on a sheet of paper here. That's too long a link for me to read. But if you'll go to this link right here, you'll learn more information about that rig. It's uh, it's really going to be nice. It's a, uh, well, I hate to say exactly what all it does, but I know it's VHF, UHF, D-Star, touchscreen, 
Uh, I think there's some GPS features with it. I'm not sure if you connect it to an external GPS or what, but, uh, you know, latest um, state-of-the-art technology there from ICOM and a, a great new VHF, UHF rig. And I'm going to have to go look at that after the show myself because I have not even seen it yet. It's okay. Excellent news to hear. Could you just hold that sign up one more time? It seemed to pixelate. I didn't really, really see it well. I don't know if it's shiny paper, but try and steady that. Or I don't know if it's shiny, but it's just a little closer, George. Yeah, if you're looking in the know. chat room, it's uh, it's in the chat room as well. So uh, there you go. Oh, okay. Is that a little that bit well? better? Yeah. Okay, good. That's well, good. I just want to make sure he, he made the sign up, so let's get it so everybody can read it. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, George. And hey, Bob, you know, I got some stuff for you if you're around. Are you there? Hi. I think Bob is gone for the night. Okay, well, we'll have to catch him on the next time. That's no problem. And let's see if there's one more that uh, I'd like to ask um, you, um, Don, if, you, if you've heard of anything about this. N2 FYE Andy, he says, can anyone recommend a basic solar setup, like a battery, a solar panel, a, a charge controller for someone who has nothing and they're just starting out? Have you heard of anything like that? Wow, that sounds like a Gordon question because he uh, he works a lot with solar over there in the, in SoCal. Gordon, you want to take that one? Oh, sure. Um, a solar Great. panel that puts out about an amp, a, a 10 watt uh, panel, you pretty much uh, can run directly to the battery. It's got a little diode, so it won't go backwards, and you won't need a charge controller. Not not for an amp into a regular sized automobile battery. But when you start talking about five and six amp output at 13.8 volt uh, solar panels, then a charge controller is a good thing to have. And you know, you go to Harbor Freight or any one of the hardware stores, even the camping supply stores, they've got good one to two amp solar panels with a little charge controller and you'll be set for QRP operation on a little rechargeable battery. Back to you, Cheryl. Hey, perfect. And here's just one last comment that I have from Phil from Portugal. And it's really uh, pointed at, at, at you, George, from a CS7 AFP again. He says, the Internet seems to have a huge interest nowadays. And when can he do a sketch? When can you do a sketch on remoting ham radios and also pan adapters or web SDR he was interested in? And I asked if he could please send those suggestions in to your uh, show email. And that's pretty much the way to roll with it. But would it be something that you would be uh, covering in the near future, George? Uh, possibly. I, I do need to sleep sometime, Cheryl, but uh, hey. I, I've covered some <laughs> of that before, and I don't remember if it was on Ham Nation or if it was on Amateur Logic, but, uh, I, well, I know we did a, a episode on Amateur Logic a while back that had several different remote control functions in it. Don't know if I've done a web SDR yet, though. Uh, maybe I need to take a look okay. at that. Oh, hey. okay, terrific, and thanks for your answers, guys. I just wanted to uh, w uh, invite everybody in to come into the 75-meter net tonight. I will be on the air tonight and uh, taking uh, your check-ins or brief QSOs on 3.847 megahertz, as usual, on 75 meters. So come on in and come on in there and, and join me, and I'd love to pick up your uh, check-in or, or have a brief chat with you, so let's do that. And what do they say? That's a wrap. <laughs> I'm Cheryl Lassick, K9BIK. Until next time, I'll see you right here on Ham Nation. Take care. Yeah, that works. Probably what it's probably just.